happy Wednesday to you. Always amazing to spend Wednesday night with you guys. And welcome to another edition of A.H. Live. And today we're featuring an incredible artist, incredible saxophonist, and uh, really an incredible guy too. Just one of the nicest guys you'll meet all on the tour. Yes, I'm talking about Jeff. Cashua, cannot wait to share this with you. We had so much fun chatting and making some music as well. Um, so it's going to be a blast. Uh, thank you for tuning in. If you are watching for the first time on Jeff's page, this is AH Live. We're here every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget to like Adam Holly Artist page because we're here every week with incredible guests and incredible music, and we'd love to share it with you. And speaking of sharing, everyone, please click share. Let's spread the love, spread the good vibes. Like I said, we're here every week. But first, we got to get straight to the music, and uh, this is quickly becoming a favorite of mine and a fan favorite as well. It's a tune off of my new album. features a good buddy of mine by the name of Marcus Anderson. Yes, I'm talking about this track. It's called Can't Stop. Thank you. 
goodness, we are just getting warmed up here. So as I mentioned, we have the incredible Jeff Cashew in the house. But real quick, before we get to that, just want to remind you guys, if you want to support the show, we make it super easy. And a big thanks to everyone that's been supportive over the last several months. You can just click those links in the description, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, and we do stars now as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone out there that have just hung with us from the beginning. And uh, if you're new to the show, it's not too late to jump on and support. So appreciate you guys. And without further ado, I cannot wait to share with you guys. Here we go. The one and only Jeff Cashua. All right. What is up, Jeff? How are you doing today? Very well. Very well, Dr. Holly. <laughs> Man, thanks so much for taking the time. And I have to comment on the background there, man. <laughs> what a setup you have. I mean, just tell us a little, we gotta start with that. What, what's the deal? Well, this is this is my daylight basement of my home in Edmonds and uh, a few years back we decided to redo it. Um, this is where I teach private students as well. Uh -huh. And it was, it was filled with really gross carpet and <laughs> disgusting carpet that we should have changed 10 years ago. And you know, and so forth. So we decided to, you know, Re refurbish it and uh, my wife said what do you want to look like down there what's the vibe i said hmm make it like a like a starbucks in asia oh. <laughs> so it's got this sort of zen den kind of vibe and i call it the zen den but man let's let's go back to the beginning um i didn't realize uh, i did some research you were born in louisville but then <laughs> made your way to washington yeah and uh, and i'm a fellow uh, northwesterner as well i'm from oregon so uh okay, you know, thank great you. great to see some northwesterners uh, doing some things but uh yeah. but yeah just just give us a just a rundown uh i mean most importantly how'd you end up with the saxophone yeah okay well how long was your show <laughs> <laughs> hey man go for it go for it <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> it's funny you said i made my way to washington imagine a two-year-old with a knapsack on a stick i mean uh, you know <laughs> no, no, my, my father um is a bio, it was a bio, biology professor and he was working at the University of Louisville. That's how he got there. And I was born there. And then soon after, he got the job at University of Washington. So we traveled to Seattle. And that's where I grew up. I'm not really, I don't really associate myself with Louisville. It's just a funny thing. Because <laughs> you don't expect it. But anyway, I, I grew up in Seattle. And um, I am a direct product of the arts and public school education. That's it. I mean, I, like a lot of people, a lot of uh, uh, these horn players, they first their first experience is playing in school band, and I did all of that, clarinet, and then later saxophone in the jazz band, all the way up through college. You know, that was my thing. So um, let's see, the saxophone. I was uh, I fell in love with it in the eighth grade when I saw what was the jazz ensemble playing in our junior high school, because up until that time I was playing clarinet and. Um, in the clar you know, in the clarinet section, we're playing classical music, concert and music, and it's great, it's wonderful. But I noticed something happening to me, like I was going to change it, Adam. <laughs> During that time, something was happening to me when we played this thing called, I remember it was called the Boogie Woogie. Oh. For concert band, this is not, this is pre-jazz band. I yeah. think I was in seventh grade, but it was just the blues, you know. Uh, 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 uh. And I, I could feel the blood boiling like this is so exciting. It was, it really affected me. And it sounds so silly. Even uh, even earlier on in playing something simple like uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, uh, our band director wrote that out for us. It, the, the beat of it, the yeah. modern sound of it at the time, really excited me. So that was it. You know, for me, jazz was it. And then, uh, so you ended up at Berkeley. Berkeley was uh, the place to be for or oh, specifically yeah. for jazz. And I went there with a mission. It's like I, I had this book of theory that I bought in high school. It's thick and had circles and diagrams and arrows and all this stuff, sharps and flats. And it was just over my head. I, I mean, I could read music, but I didn't understand the theoretical part of music, how to compose, how the, the relationship between notes and harmonies. And so I went to uh, Berkeley to learn all that, and most importantly, jazz harmony. And I got, I think I got a good education in that area. Um, and when the lights came on, it was no turning them off. It was like, oh, I get it. I understand how it works. And it's very exciting. Um, and I, I remember going back home and opening that book again, and like, I understand everything. It's like magic, right? From uh, getting a good education on that. But I, I really enjoy. It's my favorite subject to teach now. Is is harmony music theory, which I do, from this very basement. 
And then so uh, from there, you made yourself, uh, made your way to LA, right? Yep, I got a gig at Disneyland. And uh, it was um, the summer of my first, after my first year at Berkeley, got a gig at Disneyland playing in the All-American College Band. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, Huge Groove also did that too. Really? Okay. Yeah, he, was in, yeah he was in Florida, I was in, I was in uh, Los Angeles. Wow. But that was great. I mean, it was, uh, Berkeley is, is a hardcore, was a hardcore, jazz school a bunch of dudes like 300 saxophones 600 guitars <laughs> it's like a lot of people yeah. and two girls I mean, i'm exaggerating but one of them was diana crawl oh man <laughs> yeah uh i did never met never really played with her or talked to her but i did see her there but anyway um played uh, that gig and it was it was no turn it back i love the west coast it was nice nice to be back on the west coast although i've never been in california and um transferred year later to Cal State Long Beach and it, it's it was fun to be in California Southern California doing all these uh, playing at, uh, all these gigs uh, club gigs reggae gigs weddings you know all the stuff yeah. not happening in Southern California but more importantly I met the teacher Leo Potts at Cal State Long Beach who was my private saxophone instructor who taught me classical saxophone and I wanted to learn I wanted to be a good saxophone player a good musician not a not just someone who likes jazz, you know, I'm just mm. a well-rounded musician. And he tore me apart, <laughs> but not, not in a whiplash way. But <laughs> I got to tease him. Our first lesson, he said, okay, I understand you're from uh, Berkeley, which is a jazz school. I said, that's correct. He goes, okay, play me something. So I started, I was like, okay, I'm going to show him. <laughs> I'm going to play Don Lee. <laughs> you okay, know? yeah. So, da -da -da -da. Stop. It's like, you're rushing and you're sharp. Try it again. <laughs> like, wow. it, would, it wasn't mean, but it was very like real. Like I'm going to tell you the truth always, and it was kind of. I laughed and I tried another song, and it, it just no, your time is not there. Okay, let's rebuild. And from there, we spent. I am not kidding. And anyone uh, of my fellow saxophone players on the West Coast who have studied with Leo will laugh at this. We spent two weeks on one note, mm. and it's like I'm going to count you in. No, no, <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, what am I doing wrong? It's just the note's got to start before you play it, right? The Zen master, the note has to be in here before you play it. Mm. Yeah. It's before I hear it. It's really kind of cool. And anyway, so he just tore it all down and built it back up again. And to this day, I, I still am in touch with him all the time on Facebook. To this day, whenever I'm playing, whenever the horn's in my hands, I remember everything. I remember all the things you're supposed to remember for saxophone. Because there's a lot to it, there's a lot to it, and it's very simple at the same time. You know, so it's uh, sort of a, a, a mix of emotions I have, and I have a lot of thoughts about that time. So that was a very important period of my life. Please just give us a, an idea. Brandon Fields was on the way out, and uh, you jumped into the Rippingtons, and man, legendary group. And uh, how did that connection happen? It was uh, not by accident, and it wasn't fast. It, I met I met Steve Bailey, who was the bass player at the time. This is in the uh, yeah mid '80s, like '86 or so, '87, something like that. And um, I met him, and we were just talking. And I said, "Who do you play with?" He goes, oh, "I'm out with the Rippingtons." I'm like, "Oh man, I love the Rippingtons. I was a fan, you know." Yeah. And I I hired Steve because he's a great player, but also I wanted to just get to know him better to play in my group. I had a little in Newport Beach, all the thousands of hotels there. Right? I have a I had a gig there and a um, little quartet thing in the corner. And I'd hire him to play all those gigs. And on the breaks, we'd talk. And I'd say, is, is Brandon going to be leaving? Is he doing solo work? And he said, yeah, he's absolutely he's finishing an album, his first album, and he's getting ready to leave. And I said, well, I would love to audition. Or, yeah. you know, and he said, tell you what, we don't have an audition yet, and Brandon hasn't left yet, but if you want to learn these couple songs, why don't you start memorizing them so that you'll be ready? Because I'm sure that Russ will call these songs if we have an audition like Tourist in Paradise and Moonlighting. And I started to memorize them, and I'd bug him again. Next gig, next break. So I got him down. <laughs> what's, what's the scene like? But, and he goes, no movement yet, but why don't you learn these other two songs? You know? And he would just spoon feed me all these set lists of songs I'd have to learn. And in a, it was, this went on for a year, talking to him every two, three weeks. A year, I would memorized you know, three albums worth of music. I just memorized everything. I put on the CD, or the tape, <laughs> cassette tape, and just play along and just memorize it. Some of it was pretty tricky. But anyway, finally he called. Uh, Russ called for me to sub. And my thing is, uh, I will say I'm definitely not the best 
saxophonist in LA, but I was absolutely the most prepared. So that's it, and I got the gig. Aside from the Rippingtons, obviously you had this incredible solo career, and um, I came across something interesting. Another friend of ours, Dave Hooper, always told me about this group, and so I'm personally curious about Coastal Access. Uh, oh. Man, great players you had in there. Melvin Davis, Alan Hines, Dave Hooper, Dave Kachansky. Um, what, what was the impetus behind that? Uh, that that was just the group that was a kind of a continuation of that first group I was doing okay. that, that thing and when I first started doing uh, this contemporary jazz thing soloist whatever I didn't have any material so I would just you know do a Dave Grusin tune a David Sanborn tune right and over time I would swap out those tunes with my own tunes so that we only pretty soon be doing a couple covers anyway this whole process I'd call the same guys and the guys you just mentioned Hooper Melvin Davis Alan Hines Dave Gohansky and, some, and Mark Stevens, uh, keyboard players, just really the best of the best as far as I'm concerned. And um, they would be like I was on the road, but I would call them and see when they weren't on the road and try to get a gig, you know. And that's kind of the, the deal in L.A., right? You're trying to wait for people to get off the road so <laughs> you, can, you can get some really good musicians in the play. That's how well, I think we really enjoy playing with each other. So we have had some really nice moments. but. I, the group is funny. It never became like on the road traveling together because it's so expensive. And yeah. I always record with them. I always make my musical statements, so to speak, with them. Uh, but it's harder to travel with them. And once in a while we travel. But it's uh, hopefully in the future, in 2021, when the gates open up, we can get back out. And so, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the keyboardist Dave, you guys ended up writing together one of the biggest songs in smooth jazz history, Hyde Park. Uh, wasn't it number one for like 50 weeks or something? I, mean... <laughs> I don't think 50. I, maybe, maybe 15 sounds closer. But you know, okay. uh, I, did, I actually didn't have, I didn't write that song at all. Credit where credit's due. Kohansky wrote that. Okay. And uh, we had finished, it was on the, my first solo CD with Native Language called Another Door Opens. And we had finished the mixes, like, okay, we wrapped it up, we're good. And then he sent me this cassette tape, and this is so funny, on a cassette tape, in the mail, <laughs> you know. He sends it to me, before email, of course, and, uh, and I put it on, I thought, it's a cool tune, it's really nice. And it sounds pretty much like it does now, just without saxophone. And uh, he actually had this George Benson-y type octave guitar thing playing the organ. And I thought, it sounds, that's cool, I like it. Maybe for the next album, you know, you know, I'll pass on it, but thank you. And then I got a phone call from the record label saying, get in the studio. Because <laughs> Joe Sherbinet uh, was smart enough to say, no, this is a hit. Get in the studio and record it. So we got back in the studio, uh, Ricky Lawson on drums, Melvin, uh, just gave the course, and, and we pushed together. And um, I have played it ever since. That was 2001. I've played it ever since then, uh, every show, and I really never get tired of playing it. It's, it's a good tune. Well, man, so I have one more thing. I'm going to fact check you here because a couple weeks ago, Steve Cole was on the show, and he was telling me about how the sax pack got started, but I'm, I want to see if all of the facts line up. What, what is your <laughs> recollection of how that all came together? I'm, I'm, well, I'm going uh, to take I've notes. Heard him, I've heard him tell this version recently. And <laughs> He's correct. He is correct. In okay. Fact, you know, so it was, um, I was on the road with Acoustic Alchemy. And I don't know if you've ever met Miles Gilderdale from that group. Yeah. Very funny, very witty guy. So we're backstage. Uh, he played Humphreys in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. You know that little room back behind, behind the stage? We were watching television like 10 minutes before we go on. We're watching television, just chilling. And uh, the, the HBO rap pack remake was on. And we watched the whole thing and thought, and I said to him as the credits are rolling, that is so cool. I'd love to have something like that on stage. Just kind of a party off stage and especially on stage. And he joked and he said, that's it, the sax pack. And I thought, that's really clever. I'm going to trademark that. And I literally filed for trademark, <laughs> got, oh, the, wow. got the main name. I took action on it and I picked up the phone and called Steve Cole and Kim Waters. Because I, I didn't know either of them, but I we had shared the stage, or backstage, I should say, on other festivals and such. And we seemed to have a rapport, so, and I started with the rapport, like who, who can I hang with, who's funny? Yeah. <laughs> and and I got that in space with Steve Cole, because he's hilarious. Oh man, well we could, we could go on for a long time talking about your history, but I want to get to the music, and I want to get the music that's coming out now. You have a new project coming out, and um, you're going to share this video with us. 
you've got this tune, uh, The Night is Young. Tell us about the new project and about this tune. Yeah, oh, thanks. Well, the, the, um, the new project has been going on for a bit. Uh, I started probably a year and a half ago, and it's not like I've been working on it every day. Uh, just like you, I'm teaching full-time at college, and so got to fit the personal art time in between the other job, the day job time. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I've been working on it, and I've really been enjoying the process, you know. I think every album I get, I feel a little, I know a little bit more, so I think the music's maybe a little truer. And uh, this particular tune is interesting. Uh, I was in, in South Restaurant Philly playing that yeah. gig, and during soundcheck, or before soundcheck, uh, Michael Tazi was there. He was interviewing, you know, Michael. Yeah. And he did one of those Facebook Live things, and at the end of it, just like this, he said, are you working on anything? I said, yeah, I just started a tune yesterday, and I don't, I only have two chords, but I, ha I like the vibe. So I sat down at the piano and played this, the, what was the chorus, you know. And that was all I had. I said, that's it. That's my seed. I'm going to build it from there. And then I completely forgot what those two chords were. <laughs> and, and like eight months later, I thought, no, Michael interviewed me and I played them for him. So I went on Facebook and scrolled back. And he does a lot of videos like, like this on his page. Oh. Back, backwards, backwards, through time to find that interview. And then when I got to the interview, fast forward to the very end. And then I could get those two chords and I transcribed them. And so... It's funny, sometimes it, it takes some effort to go like, what was I thinking about? What was it? So anyway, uh, that's where the song came from and I kind of built the song around it. Awesome, man. Well, let's hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, the night is young.
nice enough to send one more. This time I get to jump in here and jam with you, which I'm excited about. Tell us about When It Feels Good. Uh, when It Feels Good was co-written by Kim Waters. And uh, what you're going to hear, this is him playing Clavinet and Rhodes on this thing. He's really good. And he wrote the, uh, wrote the kind of the groove. And uh, uh, it's funny, this song, I got an email from Tom Hanks, the Tom Hanks, the actor. <laughs> Uh, not specifically from him, from his production company, from Playtone Productions. And it says, we would like to use your, your song, When It Feels Good, in an upcoming Paramount motion picture starring Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts. Do we have your permission? I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you may. And it, that, it was legit. I thought it was a joke. It was legit. And it, they, basically, it's what they call bad music, background music. And uh, it got placed... Synced, uh, synchronized or placed in a movie uh, and that was a legit thing so my wife and I went to the theater with the popcorn and the whole bit it's called Larry Crown is the movie oh, yeah. got, who, who falls in love with his uh, college teacher when he goes back to school and uh, we watched the whole movie it's like where is it they, they must have cut it right and I emailed the publisher uh, they're not the publisher the person in charge of that and I and they said no it's in the movie it's in this scene I, I uh, watched the movie again when it came on cable, <laughs> and it's so low. It's the scene where they're, it was Julia Roberts and her husband, who's Brian Cranston, are breaking up. They're, this is the fight that ends their marriage. And they're in a fancy restaurant, and they leave, and the door swings open, and it's funny banter back and forth. And it's, the music you hear is the song coming from the kitchen, from an AM radio. <laughs> as, as, and it just, it's 12 and a half seconds, and it fades away. Anyway, so uh, let, why don't you and I play the uh, full volume version, full length version of the song? Yeah, let's let's crank it up. <laughs> All right, here it is. What it feels good. <laughs> Thank you. 
real quick before we get out of here, it's been such a pleasure to have you. Please let people know where they can find you online and uh, on social media. Yes, Facebook page, you know, the whole thing. Just yeah. type in my name, you'll find me, jeffkashua.com, Instagram, Jeff, uh, hashtag Jeff Kashua. You'll find me. I'm out there. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And do we have a date for the new record? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I found it. I said, it's coming out in 2020. And then, of course, COVID hit and kind of things kind of slowed down. But so we're saying 2021, It's at, we're at the mix stage. We're at the final stage. So uh, I think realistically march you know early spring well ladies and gentlemen look for the new record in early spring thank you so much jeff for coming through all right Anna. oh yes that was the one and only jeff casual wow as i said what a great guy incredible talent amazing saxophone player and uh man make sure you support him he's got the new project coming in the spring he's got a bunch of albums out already go grab them that was jeff cashwood thanks so much for coming through jeff and you know what time it is it's time for the cat cam here she is <laughs> what's up cat how are you doing today good how are you well better now that i see you but um well, first of all, you're looking lovely. Oh, thank you. You know, this was another crazy day where we just threw everything together like last minute. I was in the shower at 5.50. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've just been running around. It's been so crazy with the house and everything, but it's coming together. <laughs> we were it wrestling is. with the TV this morning, <laughs> trying to get it up on the wall, trying to get it mounted. Okay. Well, but you you were. <laughs> you and the, uh, the guy, I don't even know what you call him, a TV mounter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the TV, you know, it was too big for one person. And so, yeah, we, we had somebody come by um, to help. And, uh, yeah, we wrestled with that TV for about three hours. But we got it up. We'll have to get a picture for you guys next week so you can see. Yeah. But, um, but anyways, enough about that. What are the people talking about, Kat? Okay, well, as always, you guys already know, uh, we'd like to see where you're watching or listening from. So we have a few yeah. people. We have Sharon Bradley. She's All watching right. from Seattle. Hi. What's up, Sharon? Okay. Another Northwesterner. By the way, I forgot to mention, uh, Jeff is from Washington and li currently lives up there. And I'm from Oregon. So, uh, you know, we had a little Northwest connection going on there. <laughs> <laughs> we have Gary Fuston. He okay. says, sounding great, Adam. And he's listening from OKC. All right. OKC in the house. Awesome. We have Danny... Or I think it's Denny. Denny Manukel or Manusel. He says hello from Olympia, Washington. Okay, man. A lot of Northwest <laughs> in the house. I like it. Yeah. Ray Stone. He's watching from the Bay Area in San Francisco. Okay, what's up? Donnie Moulton, El Paso, Texas. Joy and Peter in Austin, Texas. We have some of our friends watching. Marcel Anderson. Hi, Marcel. Oh, what's up, Marcel? Marcus Anderson's twin brother uh -huh. and an incredible vocalist. Incredible Make sure you vocalist. check him out. Yeah. Uh, um, what were you saying? I was going to say, thank you, thank you for letting me uh, say something. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. I'm totally teasing. But I was actually texting. Mark Marcus texted me today, and he's like, hey, man, I'm in L.A. I was like, really? <laughs> he's here for the, uh, oh, I'm going to get it wrong. Is it the BET Awards? But he's doing something with CeeLo. Okay. So, uh, anyways, that's all. Wear Back your mask, Marcus. Okay. <laughs> and keep your hands clean, because L.A. is rampant. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> With the COVID. Crazy. Um, And we have Richard Smith. Hi, yes, Richard. Yes, what's up, Richard? Also from the Northwest, from Oregon, my former professor chair at USC <laughs> and uh, actually very excited. Richard has a brand new song coming out that I had the pleasure of producing and Jeff Cashua played on it. So look for that. That's also coming in the spring and we're very excited. It's a hot tune. So uh, what's up, Richard? Fight on. <laughs> USC in the house. I also saw Daniel Chia watching from Singapore. All hi, right. Daniel. What's Daniel? And Miss Tyson. Lou, how you doing? All right. All right. And Another who else? Oh, bonus. Steve Hall. Steve Hall, you're always watching. Steve's Thanks hanging. so much. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah. Mastering engineer extraordinaire. <laughs> of course. And then we had a few uh, comments 
On okay. your shirt. Creston Jordan says, great shirt. Well, this shirt is uh, from the Grammy wardrobe. She got this <laughs> for me. Thank you, Grammy. And by the way, shout out to Grammy. It is her birthday tomorrow. So happy all of birthday, you wish Mom. Grammy a happy birthday. And we're going to be hanging tomorrow. Make sure you have a good time. But yeah. uh, don't and forget to give her a shout out, everybody. Another birthday shout out for tomorrow, Marcy yep. Finn. What's up, Marcy? Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Marcy. Hey, you know, great minds think alike. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, and we are especially happy and grateful and blessed to be celebrating Grammy tomorrow on her birthday because this year was just so yeah. trying and she almost, we almost lost her to COVID and we are just so blessed that she's still here with us. She gets to celebrate another yes. birthday. So we are just really happy. So tomorrow is a special day for us. And we're just very blessed. So happy birthday, Grammy yeah. and Marcy. Anyone else out there with birthdays or anniversaries? Let's see. Okay, awesome. when you were with your doing your interview with Jeff, okay. so many people were saying that they loved the interview because they um, didn't know a lot about him. They knew about, yeah. of course, the um, sax pack, yeah. but not everything else. You know, uh, I learned a lot, too. You know, I, obviously, I, I always prepare, get ready for these interviews. I don't just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you end up learning a lot while interviewing these incredible artists. And, yeah, I mean, it, the very the most inspirational part of it was how he became a part of the Rippingtons. He hired the Rippingtons bass player. <laughs> the ri then that gentleman uh, was feeding him the music so that he could be ready for the audition. And as he said, he may not have been the most talented saxophonist in L.A., but he was the most prepared. So. If that isn't a testimony, I don't know what is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Cheryl Walters and okay. a few others, they also commented on loving the name The Zen Den. Yeah. So, so many people loved that. They were saying, yep. oh, we love that name. And then someone said that his Zen Den is very cool. Yeah. It looked very Zen. The it cat, really did. The cat was uh, sneaking in, too. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I saw somebody made a request for Rufus. I don't know what. I, I'm sure he's about to barge into any moment. So maybe I don't know. Rufus has been getting on my nerves, you guys, for the past couple of days. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of the new place, so we've been here now 10 days and... Has it been 10 days? Or maybe, maybe a few more, but uh, no, it's been 13 days actually. And uh, Rufus decided to leave a, a mini presents for us the other night. In fact, he went into our master uh, closet and, you know, I don't know if he thought we, uh, you know, if it was like a Santa Claus kind of thing, he left uh, several lumps of coal. I'll put it, I'll leave it like that. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and I walked in, I almost stepped in it. Oh. I was so mad. But, you know, we are in a new space, so he's, like, all kinds of confused. Yeah. But well, he had never <laughs> had to deal with stairs, so it's been kind of humorous watching him try to figure him out. But now he's, he's, he's getting that worked out. Yeah. We just got to get him to uh, not use the uh, master uh, closet, closet as a public restroom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, back to uh, the interview with Jeff. When he was okay. talking about school, Richard Smith chimed in and yeah. said, yeah, Jeff, product of public school. Yeah, and, <laughs> and myself as well. I, I went to public school in Oregon, and uh, uh, and, and my parents were also very supportive. Uh, they, uh, you know, were driving me to, to private lessons. But, um, but yeah, I was in jazz band and concert band, and that was a great experience. So, uh, you know, shout out to the public schools. <laughs> shout out. Yep. We also have uh, Robert Crutcher. He said he saw Jeff at Low Country Jazz Festival. Oh, what, what is yeah. that? Low Country That's Jazz Festival. In, I want to say, ooh, Charleston. I know it's in one of the Carolinas. That's so terrible. I was just I was there with Summer <laughs> Horns last summer. Someone will chime in and uh, and say here in the comments. Right. I saw a funny thing. Uh, let me find it here. Oh, Ellen. Ellen Nakata Harper said, Rufus left us a housewarming gift. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> um, I personally liked when Jeff was talking about when he was getting torn apart musically when he yeah. went to school by one of his um, instructors. And I can really, like, um, empathize with that. Because when we're working on my songs for my record? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Please go ahead. Don't let me interrupt. <laughs> well, that, yes. But, um, you know, I grew up doing professional theater as a dancer and also a vocalist. And so the theater world is very, very, very um, strict. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just remember going through rehearsals, dancing or singing, and same thing. You 
start the number yep. and our instructor is like, no, stop, start over. <laughs> or no, stop, that's wrong. And you're like, okay, well, what's wrong? I don't know, just fix it. Yeah. So you have to come up with, let me go through this and this and this. Does she mean this? Does he mean that? And you have to fix it on your own. Yep. And you do it probably 40 times before they're like, okay, take a break and we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. I totally understand what he means, but I mean, that's how you get good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Yeah, no, that's everything, you know, repetition. Practice makes perfect. Yeah, so, it really yeah. does. Yeah. So we have some questions for Ask All Adam. right, let's switch on over. I saw you guys are, uh, you know, you're getting with it because now I'm getting questions throughout the day. I'm getting questions in the comments during the show. So we are primed and ready. Yeah. <laughs> let's hit it, Kat. Okay. Do you want to start with the long ones or like kind of oh, the short just, ones Oh, just first? hit me. Hit me. Okay. First one is from Yvonne Jones. She says, is Adam growing a beard? And she put the little emoji like <laughs> one like this. Well, I've had this for a while. I mean, it was, it's been quite a while that I was clean shaven or had, um, but you know what? You're right. I usually trim it very low on the lowest setting. And yeah, you know, it's getting a little colder. So, you know, just trying to trying to stay warm it's november i know we're in california but it still gets kind of cold kind of cold it's cold well you know we <laughs> live in the desert you know before they built houses here it was just a desert it was a field so uh where we live uh, east of la it gets very cold at night it gets hotter you know the, the uh mm -hmm. the it's a it's a bigger spread of temperature it gets hotter at, during the day and then colder at night so we had 30s when we first moved in and then, of course, our heat was out, so, you know, we were all <laughs> cuddling by the fire, but, yeah. uh, so, anyways. So, but yeah, it's I guess, better now. It's not as cold. I guess that's, I wonder, is she asking because she likes it or because she dislikes it? That's my question. No, I think maybe <laughs> just because it's a little thicker today, so okay. maybe she's just noticing. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Linda Dickinson, oh, this is actually a question for me. Oh. It says, Kat, are you cooking Thanksgiving dinner? I know it will be a small group. Yeah. Um, I have not decided yet. <laughs> we usually uh, host Thanksgiving. Um, and since my sister has relocated to Atlanta, it's been about two and a half years now. We then, you know, started hosting Christmas. And then we also host Easter. Mm -hmm. But we're not hosting anyone <laughs> this year. <laughs> hosting or ourselves. coming soon. <laughs> um, so I don't know yet. Maybe I will cook just, you know, something small. And because, um, you know, I want that smell in the house. I really yep. love holiday cooking smell all through the house. However, if I'm tired and don't feel like doing it, then I might just order from somewhere. I yeah. think one of my girlfriends, she just ordered from Lucille's. And so oh. I might find a few spots Ooh. to like get stuff from. We had Lucille's yeah. the other day and it was right. It was <laughs> a, it's a barbecue place. Uh, it's a chain. Many of you are probably familiar with it. But um, anyways, oh, my gosh, it was so good. <laughs> yeah, it's just so crazy. You know, I, have of course... When we move, I have like I've never been busier in my life producing, mixing, um, and so uh, the studio was only down for about 48 hours. I had to get it right back up, get right back on another deadline. So we have so many boxes. A lot of our cookware is still boxed up. Mm -hmm. So you know the jury's still out. Will we even have <laughs> any of know. these boxes open by we Thanksgiving? We haven't unpacked anything really, it's, like uh, nothing. I think I unpacked one box, which was the yeah. seasonings for the pantry. Yep. And then my mom, she did my laundry room. Yep. Thanks, mom. <laughs> and um, just because you know we had the painters, so for five days we were living downstairs because they were doing everything yeah. upstairs in every room. And then when they got done with upstairs, we you know brought everything up. And then, you know, they were doing downstairs. And um, so it's been crazy. We don't have any furniture. We can't get furniture because of COVID. Uh, All the furniture stores are back ordered yeah. or sold out. So we... We ordered furniture, but it will not <laughs> arrive till 2021. <laughs> <laughs> couch we have a couch upstairs in the loft but not downstairs we don't so have crazy. a dining table yeah um we don't have a bed it's crazy it's just cray yeah so <laughs> at some point in about six weeks it'll it'll make a lot more sense but yeah uh, yeah okay so, so i guess that kind of segued into robert crutcher's question okay. saying how's the studio coming so yeah. you kind of answered that a little bit um yeah you know well musically it's been great. I'm just having a blast, and and we're we're cranking out the music here. So, um, you know, uh, uh, produ pr production wise, um, it's been fantastic. Have not done really any decorating. 
Uh, it still is a bedroom fit for a 13-year-old girl. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's some flowers on the wall and some and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So, uh, but I, I just, you know, I told Kat, we had the painters here. I said that there's no way because mm-hmm. they were they were covering everything up. And then, yeah. you know, everything was not usable for several days. And then the paint and the equipment, I was like, no, yeah. we're, we're going to have to do this ourselves. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're just Which rocking. Fine. We're just rocking it right now. And uh, as long as the music's still coming out, then uh, then we're good. Yeah. Okay. So here is uh, Michael <laughs> Mike Brown's question. Oh, is he got us again? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. He says we hear lots of terms and titles in the music industry, okay. but most really don't know what they do. What's the difference between mixing and mastering, and what is the role of a music director in terms of putting together a live concert? Yeah. And what does he or she do during the actual performance? Okay, man. I know, how, it's kind of like a run-on. How much, how much time do we have here, Mike? <laughs> no, but I'll, I'll give you the quick answer. Um, mixing is roughly, that's getting the levels of each in- individual instrument uh, where they need to be in terms of, you know, where are the drums versus the lead instruments versus the percussion. Um, and that's also adding the ambience, the reverb, delay, um, and it's also the panning. Panning just means when you decide to have something, is it in the center? Is it off to the right? Is it off to the left? So there's a lot of decisions you make at the mixing phase that are really important in terms of how it sounds. However, mastering is so important, and this is why I always use the one and only Steve Hall, who's mastered <laughs> everything from Earth, Wind & Fire to People Rising to The Bodyguard to Barry White. Mastering is like, it's like the frosting on the cake. If the cake is not good, then it doesn't matter what the frosting tastes like. But if you got a good cake and then you put that frosting on top, the sprinkles, that's what takes it over the top. And um, that's what Steve does so amazingly. And uh, But one of the main things about mastering is getting it up to the right level so that it's loud enough um, to really pop on radio and be at a commercially, uh, at a commercial volume. The other thing that mastering is important for is making a whole album or EP sound congruent so if you have different people mixing or different song types um, you know you have a ballad and then you have a up-tempo tune the mastering engineer is really important in making that whole set of songs all sound like they go together both in in tonality and in volume so super important uh, somewhat similar you're, you're dealing with the um, sonics of the song but um, they're different tasks definitely and then uh, what was this question about uh, For, what exactly is the role of a music director and what does he or she do in a live performance or oh. to get ready for the performance you know uh, there, there's a lot of different ways that a music director can be important in general usually a music director is somebody that's a conduit between the artist and the band um, so for instance uh, when I was fortunate enough to uh, fill in on American Idol, very famous music director, Ricky Minor, he would put the band together, he would interact with the artists, the contestants on the show, and then put all of that together, and that's what develops the programming. Um, I've been music director in several different situations. I was a music, music director at a church, and that's actually how I met my lovely wife, Kat. And uh, mm-hmm. so I was um, choosing musicians, writing out the charts, Uh, teaching the choir Um, so uh, basically they're they're kind of a CEO of making sure everything happens and not every music director will play on on every um, instance sometimes it's more organizational Um, for instance there's a lot of times Ricky Minor will put a whole situation together he'll be over it but he won't necessarily actually play the bass Uh, he actually called me to play on the Emmys unfortunately I was not available but uh, another really famous bassist, Carlitos uh, Del Puerto, who tours with um, Chick Corea and a bunch of other people, actually played bass, and Ricky conducted, and then of course put the put the band together and, and organized everything. So, music director is is a you know a, a really important integral um, figure when you're putting a show together for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everything kind of falls on that person, basically like a coach, yeah. if um, like in a sporting or like a teacher. So. If something's not right, then, you know, the leader of the the pack is to blame. (laughs) And Kat was music director at a church for quite a while. And, uh, you know, she was was cracking the whip. (laughs) 
<laughs> she even had me come over and play a few times, and she was like, no, no, that's yeah. not right. That's not right. You know, Gotta so. Get right. <laughs> However, I will say this, and I'm sure a lot of women and men, too, know that this is, you know, a very real thing in any type of business. Um, when there's a woman in position versus a man, you know, certain things are looked at and taken seriously differently or uh, you're looked at differently. I know whenever I would have to, um, as Adam put it, crack the whip, I would get, um, you know, labeled as, you know, having an attitude or um, mood swings or whatever. <laughs> and yeah, but if a man, you know, were to say or do the same exact things that I would have, no one would question it and they would just do it, you know? So, um, I, I'm sure a lot of women in all, you know, aspects kind of deal with that. <laughs> and I think I see some people in the comments saying, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and um, so it was just really, it was really um, challenging in that sense. And then, too, I was a lot younger than a lot of people. So I know some people don't really like that. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to um, a female and someone younger. <laughs> so what do we have here? Adam has a uh, a guest. I snuck out for a second because Rufus, you had some requests. People wanted to see you. There he is. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the individual that decided to leave the present for us in our uh, closet. And you wouldn't know it. Look at him right now. He looks so cute and cuddly. Look at him. <laughs> At our previous house, the door, it just wouldn't latch. So he would routinely barge in on every episode and, uh, you know, just trying to be just all up in the action. It's pretty hilarious. But this is Rufus. This is the family dog. He's a, uh, you wouldn't know it looking at him, but he's quite the attack dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, we're still in um, some training. He's, he's still considered a puppy. He's only three. He's going to be three. Or did he just turn three? I don't know, but <laughs> Who knows? Um, he's still in some training. He He's very anxious. The breed that he is, he's a multi-poo. Those dogs are just very anxious and kind of have like anxiety. So with new people, he gets scared and then he's barking. And um, I just don't want him to do that. I just want him to be lovable and like calm. And I always see people at the mall or restaurants and they have their dogs and the dog is sitting or walking right next to them and they're chill. And I'm like, oh, that must be so nice because I can never do that with Rufus. <laughs> and one of my cousins is like, well, anything can be reversed, but I just, I don't have the time. He's definitely got an attitude. Right, right now when I put him back outside, he was looking at me like, <laughs> like what? <laughs> Why are you putting me out? <laughs> Oh, man. Well, Kat, thank you so much. It's You're always welcome. a pleasure. Thank you for keeping track of the comments, the yes. Ask Adams. And, and if uh, we didn't get to your Ask Adam question today, we will definitely save them and ask them next week. Definitely. And speaking of next week, thanks, Kat. Appreciate you. <laughs> speaking of next week, we have an incredible guest. I've been wanting to get him on the show for quite a while, and he is available. Yes, I'm talking about the one and only... Vincent Ingala, the man, the myth, the legend, showman extraordinaire. He does it all, ladies and gentlemen. Saxophone, vocals, guitar, drums, bass, the consummate showman. So very excited. Tune in next week. And by the way, that's Thanksgiving Eve. So uh, you may be getting ready, getting the turkey, uh, um, you know, uh, Getting everything going with your meal, getting the preparations going, and uh, just take a few seconds, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, to hang out with me and Vinny. It's going to be a blast. And uh, we will see you there on AH Live. And I've got a lot of sp incredible special guests coming up. Althea Renee, Mindy Abair. Uh, Ollie Silk still working on, Justin Schultz. So um, we're going to finish up the year in style. So, Vinny and Gala next week. And by the way, I saw an order come through during the episode. Really appreciate you guys. Quick reminder, if you want to grab any of my CDs, t-shirts, and vinyl, you can do it really easily at adamholly.com slash shop. And, uh, yeah, that new album, Escape, is 
available for the first time in vinyl. We got all the CDs up there, digital downloads. So check that out. And one more time, real quick, if you want to help out the show, it's very easy. PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, and Stars. So appreciate you guys, and we always make sure to mention you in the credits at the end of the episode. So before we get out of here, I'm going to take us out on a high note. Play a tune from my second album that featured Darren Ron. Some good vibes to take you out on. It's a tune called Shuffle. Come on, y'all. Put your hands right here. Here we go.
and gentlemen, that concludes another episode of A.H. Live. Today we featured the incredible Jeff Cashua, and next week, Thanksgiving Eve, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, we have the one and only Vincent in Gala. Don't miss it. It's going to be epic. It's going to be an incredible show. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Bye.